look with us to the book of Zechariah, Zechariah chapter number 12. Um, Sister Linda shared some information with uh, both Jonathan and myself this past week about today being a special day of prayer for the nation of Israel. And so I want to look at Zechariah chapter number 12, and we'll look at a few passages of Scripture here. But we do want to have a special time of prayer for them as well this morning. And um, I, I want to preach on this thought of the deliverance of Israel and kind of what we should be praying for as a church. And so we thank the Lord for, uh, he always keeps his promises. So we thank the Lord for that. If you have your Bibles, Zechariah chapter 12, we're going to read the chapter. There's only about 14 verses here. And so if you feel like standing up this morning, you're welcome to stand up with us as we read God's word. Zechariah chapter 12, beginning in verse number one. Here the Bible says, the burden of the word of the Lord against Israel. Thus says the Lord who stretches out the heavens. Lay the, lays the foundations of the earth and forms the spirit of man within him. Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of drunkenness to all the surrounding peoples when they lay siege against Judah and Jerusalem. And it shall happen in that day that I will make Jerusalem a very heavy stone for all peoples. All who would heave it away will surely be cut in pieces Though all nations of the earth are gathered against it. In that day, says the Lord, I will strike every horse with confusion and its rider with madness. I will open my eyes on the house of Judah and will strike every horse of the peoples with blindness. And the governors of Judah shall say in their heart, The inhabitants of Jerusalem are my strength in the Lord of hosts their God. In that day I will make the governors of Judah like a fire pan in the wood pile. And like a fiery torch in the sheaves, they shall devour all the surrounding peoples on the right hand and on the left. But Jerusalem shall be inhabited again in her own place, Jerusalem. The Lord will save the tents of Judah first, so that the glory of the house of David and the glory of the inhabitants of Jerusalem shall not become greater than that of Judah. In that day, the Lord will defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem. The one who is feeble among them in that day shall be like David, and the house of David shall be like God, like the angel of the Lord before them. It shall be in that day that I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem." And I will pour on the house of David and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. Then they will look on me whom they pierced. Yes, they will mourn for him as one who mourns for his only son. And grieve for him as one grieves for a firstborn. And that day there shall be a great mourning in Jerusalem. Like the mourning of Hebad. Ramon in the place of Megiddo. And the land shall mourn every family by itself, the family of the house of David by itself, and their wives by themselves, the family of the house of Nathan by itself, and their wives by themselves, the family of the house of Levi, Levi by itself, and their wives by themselves, the family of Shammai by itself, and their wives by themselves. All the families that remain, every family by itself, and their wives by themselves. Heavenly Father, Lord, we come to you again in prayer. God, we ask that, Lord, you may, Lord, speak with us now this morning. Lord, as we pray, God, for the nation of Israel, Lord, we ask that, God, you may again bring them Lord, to a place where they would seek your face. Lord, we ask the same thing for our own church, for our own community, for our own people, Lord, that you would cause us to turn in repentance to you. God, that we would seek your face above all else. And Father, we'll love you, we'll thank you, and we'll praise you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated. This chapter here, Revelation, Zechariah chapter number 12 is really broken down into two portions 
in this chapter. The first is the promise that God will physically deliver Jerusalem. It is a physical deliverance that is prophesied that one day the nations of the world will all come against them. And in that day, God has promised that he would give them deliverance. There are some who would teach a false teaching that the church has replaced Israel and his, their promises. But we find in scripture that that is just not the case. God gave a promise all the way back in Genesis chapter number 12 and verse number 3. Here, God said, speaking to Abraham, And I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. This was a continual promise that God gave to Abraham. He said, listen, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to bless them who bless you and curse them who curses you. In spite of all of the evils that America has allowed, I do believe that one of the reasons that our nation has not yet failed is because we, God has blessed us because we have blessed the nation of Israel. God said in Genesis chapter 12 that he would bless them who would bless him and curse those who would curse him. And so we have stood by them. Although, as you watch in the news, I am fearful that our nation is beginning to shift into a new direction where we would turn our backs on the, on the nation of Israel. And I do fear that this very well could be and very well may be the downfall of our nation. God gave a promise to Abraham. Well, some people say, listen, that was a long time ago. That was just Abraham. That does not apply today. Yet we come to Zechariah chapter 12 and verse number 9. And now we're going way past Abraham. Uh, we're going generations and generations down the road. And here the Bible says in verse number 9, It shall be in that day that I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. And so we find that God gave a promise in Genesis, but now in Zechariah chapter 12 verse 9, God is keeping his promise, and it is a continual promise that has been kept. And so we find that we are to pray that God would once again deliver the nation of Israel and the city of Jerusalem. The world is at conflict right now. The just as the Nazis in Germany tried to seek the death and destruction of all Jews. We find the same thing that is being portrayed right now on our college campuses and nations all around the world as they are protesting, calling for the death of the Jews. And I, I saw there was at the, uh, I believe it was at the George Washington University there in D.C. Uh, just a week or so ago, they were chanting because the chancellor of the school was, uh, the chancellor was defending the Jewish people, and they were chanting, guillotine, guillotine, off with their head. And so they were calling for the death of those that would even stand with the Jewish people. And so the world is coming against them. And here we know that there will come a time when the world comes together to try to destroy and defeat the Jewish people and especially the city of Jerusalem. But what we find here is that God says, I promised back to Abraham that I would bless those that blessed you and curse those that curse you. And in Zechariah chapter 12, verse number nine, he says, in that day, I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. And so there was a promise given, and there also was a promise kept. But thirdly, we find here in this physical deliverance is that there is a supernatural deliverance that is going to transpire. Now, ultimately, as we study Bible prophecy, you would find that in the end that Jesus Christ does come back on his white horse, and out of his tongue comes a flaming sword of fire and destroys uh, those armies of God and Israel there at the battle. Battle of Armageddon. But even before that, here in this particular passage, in Zechariah chapter 12, in verse number 8, we find that God works supernaturally in the lives of the people of Israel. It says here, in that day, the Lord will defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem. The one who is feeble among them in that day shall be like David. 
And the house of David it shall be like God, like the angel of the Lord before them. The Bible says that in that day, even the feeble among the people are going to rise up as soldiers to be like David. The greatest, probably the greatest warrior who has ever lived, who defeated his tens of thousands and God used him as a great warrior. And the Bible says of the inhabitants of Jerusalem that the feeble among them, the elderly, those with physical ailments and, and, and strife, the Bible says they're going to be like David. God says, I'm going to bless them so that what they do prophets and they will defend themselves. And so we find that God is going to give a physical deliverance to the people of Israel. Why? Because God gave a promise and because God keeps his promise. But there is a second thing that we should be praying for physical deliverance. But there is a second thing we find in the scripture that I believe we should be praying for. And that is for the most important thing that is spiritual deliverance spiritual deliverance, that they would be delivered from their bondage of worshiping Old Testament laws at the expense of in rejecting Jesus Christ as their Savior. Ultimately, if we're going to pray, and my greatest prayer, although I am praying for peace in Jerusalem, peace in Israel, and for God to deliver them, our greatest prayer must be and should be that God would bring them to a place where they would recognize Jesus Christ is the Messiah, that he is the Lord of all. And so the spiritual deliverance must come with a recognition of Jesus Christ, not just as a some heretic that lived 2,000 years Years ago, but as who he claimed to be, the Son of God. Here we find in Zechariah chapter 12 and verse number 10, the Bible says this, And I will pour on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. Now watch this. Then they will look on me whom they have pierced. Who is that speaking of? the Lord Jesus Christ, correctly? He says that I'm going to give them grace and supplication and they're going to look on me whom they have pierced. That is Jesus Christ. There will come a day when they recognize who Jesus Christ is. It says, yes, they will mourn for him. That is Jesus Christ. They will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son and grieve for him as one grieves for a firstborn you see the day will come when they as a people recognize just what happened that jesus christ their messiah they crucified and the bible says they're going to mourn for me as one mourns for their only son Interesting wording because we know in John three sixteen that God gave his only begotten son. He is the only son. And so the day will come when they recognize who Jesus Christ is. And so as we pray for Israel, yes, we should pray for peace. We should pray for calmness and for loss of lives to be stopped and ceased because of the hatred towards them. But our greatest prayer should be this, that they would come to recognize that Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of Isaiah chapter 53 that he is who he claimed to be the son of God and they would come to a place where they would repent of their sins and their wickedness and come and place their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ but only should be praying that for Israel but we should be praying that for Etowah and McMinn County in Tennessee in America we should be coming to a place where we pray God yes I understand there's financial hardships there's political hardships there's things going on around us that we don't understand Understand, and we don't like, but our greatest need is that we would come to a place where we recognize that we have crucified the Lord Jesus Christ because of our sins, and we repent of our sins and mourn and long to turn back to Him. Recognition of Jesus. We must recognize Him. We should pray for spiritual deliverance that Israel would come to recognize Him before it's too late. See, the truth is we know from Scripture the time will come that they will place their faith in Him. They will recognize Him as their Savior. But how many generations and thousands and millions will perish? 
never placing their faith in Jesus Christ. We should pray, Lord, would you open their eyes that they would see Jesus. Recognition of Jesus. Second of all, and I've already mentioned it, but it comes right there with it. It is the repentance. It says in verse 11, and that day there should be a great mourning in Jerusalem. Like the mourning of Hadad Ramon in the plain of Megiddo. The plain of Megiddo there, the valley is where the battle of Armageddon will be. And, they, and the land shall mourn, and every family by itself. We read those verses. They're all going to mourn. There is a repentance. They're mourning because of their sin, what they have done. Now, see, there are some who will try to say, oh, yeah, the, the, the Jews killed Jesus. Are they guilty? Sure. But so are you and I. They're guilty because they're sinners just like you and me. And it is our sin that caused his death. The Bible says that they're going to mourn. So I can't point my fingers at them and say it's your fault. No, the truth is I have to point the fingers at myself and say it's your fault. And we need to pray that they will recognize that, but also we better be careful to make sure we recognize just what our sins cost. Our sins cost everything. It's our sins that cause Jesus Christ to come and lay down his life to ransom us because we're guilty. We, We have committed sins and offenses before a holy, righteous God that were so damnable that we, that it caused us to be damned to eternal judgment in hell. And because of his love, Jesus Christ came and laid down his life for us. And I'm guilty just as much as you are. The truth is, though, that oftentimes we come to a place where we think, well, we're not that bad. Yeah, I may do a little things here and there, but at least I'm not the murderer, the thief, the liar, the predator. I, I may be bad, but I'm not that bad. Yet your sin cost Jesus Christ his life. You're as wicked as anybody, just as I am. The Bible says they'll come to a place where they're going to repent. They're going to begin to mourn. The Bible says that godly sorrow works repentance, meet for salvation. In other words, when we come to a place where we recognize our sin and we're convicted of our sin and we begin to mourn our sin, then we are meet, ready for salvation. But the Jews, they don't believe they need that. They'll work their religion. They're okay. And many people sitting in our pews have the same mindset. Oh, we, I'm okay. I prayed a prayer. I believe in God. And never understand how costly and wicked our sin is. And Jesus said, but except you repent, you'll perish. I wonder this morning, have you ever mourned your sin? We should pray, Lord, would you deliver physically the nation of Israel, but God also would you deliver them spiritually, that they would recognize Jesus is God in the flesh. They would repent of their sins. But this morning, I also want to ask you, do you know Jesus? 
Has your sin ever bothered you? Does it bother you? It should. Because our sin cost him his life. So this morning we're going to pray here just momentarily for the nation of Israel. I want to ask you to join me in prayer. But as we pray, I also want you to be honest with yourself. Has there ever been a moment in your life where you truly repented in godly sorrow and turned to Christ? Or is Christianity and religion just an add-on to your life like a supersized fry you're trying to get the benefits? He's just an extra. Or have you truly turned to him? As we pray, Heavenly Father, Lord, we come to you in prayer. God, I pray this morning, Lord, for the nation of Israel. Lord, I love the people. God, yet many of them, or most of them, Lord, are dying and headed to a crisis hell because they've rejected you. Lord, you said not to fear those who could harm the flesh, but, Lord, to fear the one that control our soul. Lord, I want peace there. Lord, I pray for their protection but God not so that they can live a life of ease but God that they may have another day to repent and turn to you Lord Satan's blinded their eyes God I pray Lord may you reveal yourself to them again Lord that they would see you for who you are God, that they may have salvation, Lord, before it's too late. Lord, I pray that you be with every person who's here this morning. Lord, you know the heart. God, you know our spiritual condition. Lord, there may be someone right here in our midst today, God, who has maybe said a prayer at some point. Lord, they've tried to have a feel-good religion. But, God, they've never truly recognized you for who you are. And, God, they've never seen themselves for who they are. Lord, if that's the case, God, I pray that right now, Lord, they would bow their heads, Lord, in true repentance. God, turn their lives over to you. Place their faith in the work that Jesus Christ did upon Calvary. Lord, entrust in you before it's too late. Father, we love you. We thank you. In Christ's name I pray. No one looking around this morning, please. Please, no one looking around. I wonder today, just between me, you, and the Lord, I wonder, is there one here today who would say, Pastor, I'll just be honest with you. I'm not sure that I've ever truly repented of my sins and turned and placed my faith in Jesus Christ. Pastor, I hope so. I want to do that, but I'm just not sure. I don't know that I'm saved. I'm not trying to confuse you this morning, but I want to pray for you. Is there one who would slip your hand up and say, Pastor, pray for me. I'm just not certain. Would you slip your hand up and back down? I won't embarrass you, but I will pray for you. Is there one? Is there one? I see that hand. Is there another? Is there another? Say, Pastor, pray for me.
I'll be praying for you. As I said, I will. I promise I will. This morning, if you need to come and maybe you know you're saved, but in your heart you have a family. Maybe it's a son or a daughter or a grandchild, a neighbor, a co-worker who you're concerned about. This morning, maybe as Brother Stephen's playing, maybe you ought to come down and say, Lord, I just want to bring their name down and lay it on the altar. God, please, would you save them before it's too late? How many of you, just slip your hand up, how many of you have a family member or someone that you love that you're not sure they're saved? Raise your hand up. I see hands all over. This morning, if that's you, as he plays, if you want to come pray for him this morning, the altars are open.